professor at CSU, and he teaches sculpture, digital fabrication, and ceramics. His art practice spans genres of sculpture and design and integrates uh, traditional, manual, and skill-based forming processes with digital fabrication technology. So Dell's been invited to lecture widely right here and many places, and recent lectures include Syracuse University, the Emerson Museum of Art, the Auerbach Endowed Lecture Series at Hartford Art School, Current Perspectives Lecture Series at Kansas City Art Institute, and his work has been exhibited recently at the Milwaukee Art Museum, the Denver Art Museum, the Arizona State University Art Museum, Vox Populi, is that how you say it? Populi Gallery, the Voice of the People. The Voice of the people. Um, Museum of Fine Art Boston, Hawk Contemporary in Kansas City, Missouri, and Harvey Meadows Gallery in Aspen, Colorado. Um, so please welcome Bill. So I live in Fort Collins, Colorado, um, uh, where my wife Sonam and I both live in the pottery area at Colorado State University. Um, this is a really amazing piece of Sanam's. She's a potter. Um, at CSU, I also teach in sculpture and digital fabrication, as Holly said. Um, when I first got to CSU, uh, I uh, spent a lot of time developing this kind of fab lab, shop space, computer lab, um, which has a whole bunch of uh, 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 digital fabrication tools in it. Um, and kind of building it out involved sort of asking all of these questions that I think a lot of art departments are asking right now. Um, many of the 3D areas specifically um, have been thinking a lot about uh, these questions of how do we sort of take these digital tools and integrate them into the space and then the curriculum of, um, of an, art, an art department and sculpture departments and ceramics. Um, so I'm really happy to talk more about that again, if that's something you guys are interested in. Um, it seems like uh, seems like there are things you're really engaged with here um, through the facility for arts research, which I had the opportunity to visit yesterday, and it was really exciting. Um, there have been uh, a bunch of different parts to this project for us. Um, this was a, a visiting faculty program that I put together. Um, so we're over a couple of years, we were able to invite um, a number of really incredible artists um, in to teach one course at CSU a semester. And um, really the only, uh, uh, so I tried to always invite people whose work somehow existed at the intersection of digital technology and then some kind of traditional craft material. And um, the only sort of uh, uh, prompt that we gave them for the class is they just had to do something that introduced the students to all of the different tools in this lab. And so um, we had uh, Andy Brayman, who's a really incredible kind of hacker potter who lives in Kansas City, Missouri. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Unfold Design is a really um, innovative uh, design, a collaborative team uh, who lived in Belgium, came and taught this uh, uh, semester course. And they all sort of take it on in really different ways, and uh, it gives our students just this really wide range of different uh, possibilities for thinking about the tool set um, that we have, both technically and conceptually. Um, I just wanted to talk about one project at a little more length um, that we worked on in this lab, and then I'll kind of get into my own work <coughs> proper a little bit more. Um, so I've also taught this class, which we just called Digital Fabrication a number of times. And um, this one semester, um, uh, I was approached by um, uh, uh, an artist, friend of ours, who lives in Aspen named Allegheny Meadows. And Allegheny has been running this project for about 15 years, which he calls the Art Stream Nomadic Gallery. And um, basically, it's an Airstream trailer that he's retrofitted as a portable gallery, and in it he shows some of the best studio pottery being made in the US today. And he takes it to the Aspen Farmers Market every weekend, but he also has traveled all over the country with this project. So he's been to the Museum of Art and Design in New York. Um, uh, he goes to the NSICA conference every year. Um, he's been all over the place with it. Um, so 
the original trailer was getting older, and he'd recently purchased this new 19-foot trailer, um, and he wanted to uh, turn this new trailer into a gallery space. So he reached out to uh, us about doing the project in our shop using the digital fabrication tools. And um, we just decided to teach it as a semester-long design build class. Um, <coughs> so we started off by building a quarter-scale model of the Airstream trailer. So that was kind of the first um, introduction to CAD modeling for really all of the students in the class. Um, so a bunch of measurements of the trailer. It was parked up behind the art department, we had to measure it really precisely. And then we unfolded it and um, had it uh, aluminum water jet cut, uh, at a water jet cutter on campus, and then we folded it back up to make this quarter scale model. And then that became the kind of site um, for doing a bunch of scale tests and different configurations and possibilities for the interior. Um, one of the things that was uh, really exciting for me about um, teaching this course that was um, I guess sort of a surprise, um, a little bit different from uh, many of the art classes I've taught, is how you know collaboratively it forced the students to work, um, but how the space of um, the computer-aided design software um, became this incredible sort of site to share information and work together in a really intimate way on one kind of really complex object. Um, but then equally important in the class was um, really this kind of movement like in and out of the computer between the <coughs> virtual space and physical materials. So this is another uh, scale model that we cut on the um, laser cutter. Um, and then when we started, we had a, a number of kind of design critiques where Alvin would come down from Aspen and he'd talk about um, both our concepts for the design um, and then talk about the models we constructed. And then we really wanted to actually push this through to a full scale, um, the actual uh, interior uh, in this one semester. So about halfway through the class, we moved into um, the full scale construction. So we kind of scaled up to our large CNC milling machine. Um, the idea was that it was all a kind of flat pack construction um, that uh, fit together with these notches. Um, and then it also had to be able to break down and move in and out of the trailer pretty easily. Um, this is Camila Friedman Gerlitz, who's the TA for the class. Really um, amazing, actually kind of unique art student. But she was uh, pursuing a PhD in math when I met her at the University of Texas at Austin. And she'd done a little bit of ceramics in undergraduate school. <coughs> she decided to. Um, her math program wasn't really doing it for her, and she wanted to go back to school for art. So she spent two years, actually, in the special student program in our um, program. And she was kind of this like ideal sort of person to really push our digital technology um, to, the, to the limits, or digital fabrication technology to the limits. And she used really all of the tools in her shop in some really exciting ways when she was there. Um, so this is the kind of interior um, as we're starting to put it together, and then just a quick shot of uh, the interior kind of installed in the trailer. And um, I'm sorry I don't have any pictures of the trailer kind of fully in action, um, but we actually last year um, we took this to the uh, National Council on Education and Ceramic Art Conference in Kansas City, and we curated a show that went inside of this space of all work by artists who are using um, some kind of digital technology in creating certain objects. And it was cited right inside the convention center. It was cool to see it in action inside that space. Um, so uh, I'm going to kind of switch over to talking about my own work now. Um, I'd like to start by talking about some of the work I've been doing most recently. Um, in a way, this work is a return to um, uh, a kind of work that was really there at the very beginning, uh, uh, the point where my engagement with art making became really passionate and consuming. Um, so 
I want to start by talking a bit about volumes or containers. Um, so forms which both inhabit and also contain space. Um, when I give artist talks, uh, they're usually organized using some combination of thematic and chronological structures. Um, and that's the case here. Um, and then I think there's another kind of form that I've been thinking about that sort of runs through this talk, um, which is a kind of elliptical form, which I think makes sense for both the objects I'm talking about, um, but also the way that I think about those objects. It's a kind of form that implies a sort of thinking and working um, that involves repetition, um, also a kind of orbit around ideas. Um, it's a thinking which involves a kind of oscillation. Um, and it's a kind of thinking which I think is really required in order to think a vessel. Um, so a vessel is a thing which is always both holding and failing to hold. Um, it's a thinking which requires uh, a, a kind of thinking about a duality between interior and exterior, um, between the stability of containment and the generosity of pouring out, um, and the possibility of an interior becoming an exterior. So the, this is a version of a talk that I've been working on for a while called Equivalent Volumes. And um, this is also the title of this recent piece. Um, this piece is a kind of still life. And I'll talk about the idea of the still life a little more um, later on. Uh, it's an idea that's always very operative for me in the studio. Um, this uh, piece is uh, involves these four geometric solids. Um, they're all hand-built out of clay. Um, the amount of volume that each of them contains is the same. And the amount of volume each of them contains is also specific. Um, it comes from this object and this photograph, uh, 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 this object on the table. Uh, this is a photograph of the potter Lucy Ree, taken by Edward Snowden in 1990. Um, this photograph, to me, you know, it's kind of a portrait, but it also feels like a kind of a still life. Um, the table surface has this compositional structure, um, the light in the image, the relationship between the fullness of the jar, and her diminutive, um, almost desiccated body. They occupy just the same amount of space. Um, this is some of Lucy Rhee's work. Uh, she was a very important modernist potter. She was born in Vienna. Um, her um, parents were part of a really uh, uh, part of a really affluent Jewish family in um, in Vienna. They were friends with Sigmund Freud. Um, she trained there during the two world wars, uh, between the two world wars, um, and during a really interesting moment, I think, for the thinking around um, the relationship between the fine arts and the decorative arts and architecture and design. Um, in 1938, she fled Nazi Austria and moved to Great Britain. So all of these objects contain the same volume as this object on the table. Um, this object on the table is called a moon jar. Uh, it's a traditional Korean form. Uh, it's about the idea of the full moon. We're creating a pot or a volume that contains as much space as possible, so it's as, as round as it can be. Um, it was a pot that was given to Lucy Rhee by Bernard Leach in 1943, and Bernard Leach is this kind of grandfather of the studio pottery movement. Um, so the, the piece is about her, um, the piece is about this object. Um, this is also really about volume um, and the idea, the possibility, or really the impossibility, I think, of equivalency. Um, it's also about containment. So the things a volume can contain, the things a pot cannot contain. And volume is this really fundamental idea for pottery form, so something I've been interested in for a long time. Um, 
that the idea of volume and equivalency is something uh, that I was also really thinking about a lot, but in a really different way when our son William was born. So as he was born, watching his head come out, and the way when a baby is born, their head is so flexible and malleable. And I remember the midwife just like reaching in and like digging her fingers into the soft head and pulling. And it's this like totally terrifying thing. <laughs> you're gonna hurt, you know, you're gonna hurt him. Um, and then he came out and he had this really squish pointy in his own head. Totally it compressed so it was shaped. And it actually took a really long time for it to become round again. Uh, so for a few months we actually had to take him to physical therapy. And um, he had this really flat side at the back of his head, and because it was flat, he would sleep on it, and then it would become more flat, and then he would only turn his head in one direction, because he was always like resting on that one side. So it all sounds really bad, but I guess it's a super common thing um, that a lot of babies go through. Um, so we were going through this process with the physical therapist of um, trying to shape the volume of his head. Um, no matter what shape it was, you know, it had to contain a certain volume, it had to contain something. It had to hold his little brain. So the shape keeps morphing but it still needs to hold that brain, you know, that mind, that individual consciousness. Um, what is that amount? You know, what's that amount of volume that that needs to hold? So all the objects on this table contain a specific volume, but they also, in a way, contain or maybe fail to contain this thought, or these collections of thoughts. Um, they uh, contain or allow for this thinking about volumes, you know, a thinking that can contain both the Korean jar um, and the changing shape of our son's head, and then maybe some larger or more abstract question that both of these things kind of push up against, right? How much uh, can a container contain? So I taught a craft theory seminar class last semester. And um, one of the ideas that uh, we ended up talking a lot about is the relationship between like ideas and medium, concept and materials. And um, for me, I always feel like the ideas are I start with are kind of more like an intuition. Um, they're questions more than really fully formed ideas. And I always feel like I need um, both the technique of making, but also the material itself to kind of think through. So I can have a part of a thought um, without beginning to really physically make a piece, but the thought always becomes richer and more complex. It, it sort of gains more fidelity through the actual making of the work. Um, I think this is an idea that's really endemic to craft. Um, something I think about a lot is this um, quote by Richard Sennett um, from his book The Craftsman, which was actually kind of an updating of uh, a thought from Claude Levi-Strauss, who said that basically food is both good to eat and also good to think with. Um, and uh, Sennett actually took this idea and applied it to clay. So what Levi-Strauss meant by this is that the act of eating know, ingesting food um, gives us the idea, it's through that material that we have the idea to share a fire, to cook together, um, to share a space of shelter. Um, so we actually need that material in order to have these thoughts, to think these thoughts. Um, another um, Close, a close friend of mine, the poet Dan Beachy Quick, wrote this beautiful thing about um, the work of thinking, which is something that I think about, seem to think about a lot. Um, so I'd just like to read kind of this little um, passage from something that my friend Dan wrote, who will sort of say, articulate this idea much more eloquently than I could. Um, uh, Dan says, uh, and he's talking about Walden, Henry David. In the second 
chapter of Walden, where I live and what I live for, Thoreau writes, my instinct tells me that my head is an organ for burrowing. As some creatures use their snout and forepaws, and with it, I would mind and burrow my way through these hills. I trust this creaturely turn, the synecdoche in which head stands in for that organ mind. And whatever <coughs> thinking is, it digs more than it soars. To mine and to burrow replace more typical images of the mental process. One seeks the richest vein coursing within more typical or coursing within the hills. The other knows that dwelling is the effort of deepest thinking. No longer is thought a means by which one is removed from the stuff of the world up into those ethereal realms where forms replace matter, the pattern more primary yet less tangible. No, thinking is to dig down into the matter itself, to give over to the old occult sense that only within things can their truest worth be found. Vain, evocative, not only of gold and silver and diamond, <coughs> but also of blood, also of the earth thing that is the body. So, yeah, there's something to me about the, the time that working with the material like clay requires and the physicality of it that I think allows for this sort of slowing down that I feel like I need to, to think. Um, I use a range of different technologies in my work. Um, so I'm going to talk uh, quite a bit about process and techniques and technology. Um, <coughs> The way that I use technology, I think, creates another kind of oscillation um, between two kinds of thinking. So sometimes I'm thinking about these really technical problems, and then sometimes I'm thinking about the more theoretical or poetic implications of those things. Um, this is a little um, kind of grasshopper <coughs> definition. It's a plug-in for a CAD modeling program called Rhino. And this was a really little uh, definition. It's kind of like a visual programming language it in that way. Um, there's a little grasshopper definition that I used in order to figure out these different shapes. Um, so you can kind of squish them and move them around. Um, but it always gives you three shapes which contain the same amount of volume. Um, I think about technology a lot. Um, I think about technology uh, both in kind of the specific way that I think we're usually accustomed to thinking about it, which is a kind of way of achieving an end or a result. Um, I also think about technology a lot in much more um, kind of broad ways. Um, so I think about technology in the way that like Michel Foucault uses the term technology in his essay, The Technology of the Self, um, where he's sort of referring to technology incredibly expansively as like any form of instrumental reason. So uh, all of these things, structures, systems, which we've created to actually conceptualize the notion of the self. Um, so I'm really interested in this as well. Technology is something that we use to think with. Um, all of the work that I make, I think, deals with ideas that are very much germane to ceramics. So these are ideas of containment, porosity, um, relationships between parts and wholes, um, relationships between objects and language, the body as a volume or container, um, and its representation uh, as a way of evoking or venerating fertility and grappling with the um, corporeal and the impermanent. Um, that I made, it's a few years old now. Um, it, um, term that I've been working on, for working with for a while now. Um, it's sort of connected to that uh, previous form, just in the sense that it's a, um, it's a tessellating volume, um, but it's a shape which actually tessellates three-dimensionally rather than two-dimensionally. <laughs> um, 
and the shape is called a truncated octahedron. Um, and so I've made a number of pieces that I'll just kind of run through all um, employing this shape as the sort of underlying structure. Um, this was the first piece, um, which was made and just come, I came upon it really just a very empirical way. I'm actually just cutting little shapes out of foam core and taping them together until I found a place, a, a shape that kind of nested and tessellated in an interesting way, and then um, making a mold of that and casting it uh, in a black porcelain or in an open porcelain green. Um, and I was interested in sort of scaling that form up and uh, creating uh, a, a sort of modular system using the same geometry, but uh, in a way that um, engaged or introduced a kind of porosity into the system. Um, so here I kind of started with a digital model, um, used some grasshopper definitions and some computer algorithms to kind of um, begin with the sh just the sort of shell or outlines of those shapes and then to smooth them into a more organic form. And then um, I wanted to make this, reproduce this larger shape um, using slip casting. So then it was kind of a process of going back into this really complicated uh, shape and trying to find a sort of seed inside of it that when you cast it over and over again, it would sort of aggregate out and truncate it off the hedron and then um, kind of taking a derivative shape off of that and then water jet cutting these units out of um, aluminum um, and then they're just pop riveted together like in the gallery space. So this particular configuration, it's a kind of a chandelier, it's about 15 feet tall. And um, this system is, it's a really fun uh, kind of system to work with like in an installation. It's this piece, like you walk into the gallery with a bunch of parts in a shoebox. And then in a few hours, you can kind of rivet, rivet this piece together and really sort of play with the way it fills a room, fills a larger space. Um, it's really efficient in a way. Um, this is another version that I'm working on, just kind of taking advantage of the actually um, this, this process of using the CNC milling machine to mill molds. You can make like really complicated molds like really, really fast. Um, so this is a piece that I've actually gotten further along on, but I don't have any more pictures of it. But you can see the thickness of the um, kind of mesh sort of structure kind of gets it gets thinner and thinner as it moves towards the top. So this one uses like 25 unique molds um, to build this larger form. Um, so. Uh, I think a lot in the work about these relationships between parts and wholes. Um, and I think about that in different ways, you know, both in terms of like these really, you know, tessellation and really rational ways that I mean, kind of rational and intuitive ways of organizing objects in a space. Um, so thinking both about the objects themselves, but also about um, associations, connections, <laughs> conversations, and friction. Um, I think this is, it's a kind of practice that's both about creating meaning, um, but also about breaking meaning down. Um, and it's also about using the space of the studio itself as a kind of technology to think through. Um, <clears throat> some of the still lives I think about, Giorgio Morandi. Constantine Brancusi. Um, this is, I think of this as a sort of a still life. This is the studio space of Constantine Brancusi. And this is a, this is an example that I think, think often about. Um, these are two images, um, both of the, um, it's also for the Enseca conference, the last time I was in Portland, Oregon. And um, it was a kind of reproduction of Brancusi's studio um, based on two images that he'd taken of his own studio space. Um, instead of making the forms and kind of shipping them to the site, um, the, the actual architecture here was just constructed all from things that were bought in Portland, like from the local Home Depot store. 
and then <coughs> all of the forms here are of plaster that was cast on site or um, wet clay that was packed there. Um, so instead of actually shipping objects, um, I just shipped a bunch of molds and the molds were packed like inside of crates which also contain molds. Um, so this whole system kind of unpacks and then you sort of fabricate these forms and then put these things out of the way at the end. Um, so it's this freak snowstorm in Portland in the middle of March, which is kind of this really serendipitous lucky accident. Um, and we're kind of getting on with time, so I'm just going to kind of move fairly quickly through the last few pieces. Um, this is an installation from a few years ago at the Denver Art Museum. Um, it consists of that uh, black slip cast porcelain piece we saw earlier. Um, this piece, which is about 10 feet long, made up of these modules, which are press molded earthenware, and then this um, wall, which was built to extend an existing wall. It's about 13 feet high, and 9 feet wide, and then it's flat on both sides with these really large uh, press molded ceramic tiles, um, which are all coming out of the biggest ones are 3 feet by 2 feet. Um, so I'm just going to finish up by talking a little bit about these two uh, installations. Um, they were both um, created uh, in the same um, gallery space. It's called Hot Contemporary in Kansas City, Missouri. And they were both, uh, they were made about one year apart, almost exactly one year apart. And, um, uh, you know, these installations, I think, are very much about this idea of hearts and holes. Um, you know, each object uh, is a kind of a thought in and of itself. And um, when they come together, they form this kind of constellation of ideas. Um, so I'm just going to kind of move through some images fairly quickly and then I'll just talk about a couple of objects just to give you the ideas behind them. Um, this is a, a, a long table. This table is about 16 feet long. Um, it sort of supports these six sort of torso size ceramic sculptures which are made using both hand building and um, some digital technology and mold making. a piece called Cactus Kuros Kintsugi, and um, it's a kind of just conflation of a number of ideas which felt sort of connected for me. Um, so this kind of awkward green cactus growing in my studio, um, thinking about Noguchi's uh, marble Kuros figures, <laughs> kind of stacking the structures, and then um, uh, the Kuros figure um, kind of refers back these Socratic Greek um, marble figures, which were about you know, the kind of idealized young male body. Um, and then about um, Kintsugi, which is the Japanese art of repairing broken ceramics with little bits of gold. And um, so the piece for me was a way of just kind of thinking about you know, the beauty of the young body and um, the kind of awkwardness of the body as it moves towards this little tiny piece of aluminum foil that was sort of floating around the edges of my studio for a number of years. <laughs> Some of these like kind of little bits of detritus that, you know, it's floating around for some weird reason you don't throw it away. Um, you sort of start to notice it and you like notice yourself noticing it. <laughs> uh, and then, you know, beginning to think about how to think about it in another way. So I ended up taking this really high resolution scan of this wad, um, and then kind of painstakingly <coughs> holding the surface using digital CAD technology, um, 
laying it out into sheets and then having all of the pieces water jet cut um, out of aluminum and then manually uh, over a like three day kind of marathon session manually um, mm -hmm. measuring all the angles of the folds and folding it back up and pop ribbing it back together from the interior. <laughs> <laughs> term Gubad, it's this term from anthropology, which kind of refers to this range of different practices through which um, men try to sympathetically um, experience the act of childbirth. <laughs> <laughs> so it's about, you know, I think the way that something um, may be significant can issue forth from, you know, a little piece of, you know, insignificant a bit of detritus, um, and I was also putting this together kind of during the last trimester from my wife being pregnant with her son. You know, each, each one of those facets has bent flanges on all of its edges. Not everyone does, so it'll be like 10 facets together, and then there are little perforations cut, and then each edge, like I made a little program that like labels each of the edges with the fold angle. So then you kind of go back with the hand angle measuring tool, and then you're like, okay, this one needs, so a lot of them just need to bend to like, you know, 15 degrees, and then it'll create sort of a larger panel, and then those have flanges that bend in and have little holes on the inside, and then those like mate with the adjacent panel. So then you can go inside and just pop your bits from the inside. So there are about a thousand pop your bits. Um, this is a piece called Parametric Chair. Um, <clears throat> uh, this is kind of about this idea that um, it's talked about a lot in kind of circles of design and digital fabrication, um, which is the idea that digital fabrication technology might make possible um, these production models in which actually it's an automated production model, but actually everything that is made would be unique or customized, so that would be a mass customized. Um, so it's a kind of design project and also a sculpture, I think, um, about sort of applying this notion to a chair. Um, so it's the original kind of chair form was taken from the Ray and Charles Eames potato chip chair. And then I created a similar kind of grasshopper definition, like a morphing pottery form, which morphs between a range of different possible chair forms. <laughs> and then I've made a number of these um, which are customized um, to the bodies of friends or people who are important to me. So a really specific chair um, rather than a kind of generic mass-produced chair, but made in a really quick way. Using a CNC machine to create some joinery. And then this is finally a um, last piece I'll talk about. Um, a piece called salve, <coughs> and um, it's an aloe plant that was uh, molded and then cast in bronze. And um, this piece was about like, you know, like growing up as a pretty redhead and you know as a young, very white person, um, <laughs> uh, sunburns were always. Uh, <coughs> common occurrence growing up and we had this aloe plant um, in our in our house and this kind of ritual of like breaking off a limb from this aloe plant and like rubbing the gel on your skin was just sort of incredibly soothing um, kind of ritual uh, as, as a child and um, so it was a piece that was kind of thinking about that and um, also thinking about then what it means to try to take a moment like memorialize it or fix it. Um, so um, in order to actually make the piece, you know, to take this mold, um, you have to kill the 